Good morning and welcome to Where is the Trade for Tuesday, October 6th of uh, 2020. Patrick Ceresna here. And uh, I, I know my uh, master's members are impressed I got the date right this time. It was funny, I pulled a Ron Burgundy yesterday. Uh, the typo came in as uh, October 10th on uh, the master's slide and I read it like a perfect Ron Burgundy. Like it's like uh, pretending it really was still, anyway. It is October 6th today. I'm pretty sure I got this right. Uh, anyway, so uh, the um, uh, markets are, uh, I, I think everyone got a pretty good uh, summary in terms of, uh, uh, in, the, in the macro masters, in terms of where we are in the market. I um, am very, very, I, I'm interested in what just happened in oil. Uh, I'm, and, uh, and this to me is actually quite relevant I look at uh, what happened here in terms of this reversal sequence, and I have to say that I don't want to talk it up too much, uh, but this is this may be a major turn, uh, and the, uh, I'm I'm so very interested in what just happened here, like for so typically you uh, so we had this advance in crude oil, and. Uh, all of you heard an interview with like uh, Art Berman talking about structural demand and all this, and more or less the last three, four months has been the crude oil and energy markets coming to the reality of uh, the fact that demand is not coming back as fast as everyone wanted. So crude oil begins a, a correction that uh, typically w leaves room for a correction that could have come right to the FIB zones at, down to 32 to 34. And even up to yesterday, when we were online together, that window to the downside was still open for that point C to finish off and us uh, to hit into these FIB zones. It's amazing how quick things turned in just 24 hours since our last webinar. And more importantly, what is the most impressive is that the sequence of these two green candles coming up has basically wiped out the, cell, uh, the, the last cell impulse. This is happening at the same time as almost in the energy complex, almost every energy stock is to one manner or another completing measured moves to the downside or Fibonacci retracements to the downside. Now, I cannot guarantee anything. Like there's no certainties in the stock market, but opportunities that offer the type of asymmetry that energy is giving right now don't come often. It's a, it's a, a scenario where the, uh, the amount of risk we have to take to be in these trades versus the potential upside potential in all of them is beautifully asymmetric in our favor. And, uh, and yesterday and, I, and after I get off this webinar today, I'm going to be continuing to pad up uh, a substantial amount of energy trades into my portfolio. Now, a lot of people ask me, how much energy are you planning on owning? I uh, plan on owning a lot, so, but the way I trade uh, and many members have uh, caught on to this. It's not about a percentage allocation, but it's about the management of the risk with options. And so I could easily be carrying 100% of the value of my portfolio on a leveraged basis uh, along energy, but with using tactical callers and hedges and, and management of the thing, I more or less still can manage my risk down to like, a 5% drawdown on the portfolio if I was a hit. This is the key is, is that it's not, uh, it, it's, you just need to uh, have some way of creating an exit strategy uh, for if the trade doesn't develop the way you want. Anyway, I'm optimistic. I don't want to overly hype, but I, at the same time, I don't want members to let this slip uh, because I didn't put enough emphasis on it. So it's a, I'm trying to uh, kind of pivot a fine line where pay attention to what's happening here because this could have been a key to her point. Now, part of our breakout trades is Halliburton, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But really, uh, just looking at it from an XLE and an, X, um, and an XOP perspective, 
you can observe that what we had was a major bottom and we began uh, a, a two part sequence, this, uh, uh, of this two leg sequence to the downside that was essentially uh, uh, almost a perfect measured move on the XLE down to the target zones, which we uh, qualify as a key bottom retest. Now that, that uh, is, didn't go for a full double bottom retest the way, where it, way it would on um, uh, the downside, but uh, the, um, it, it does qualify as a test. Now, could, there still, could we be early? Could there still be one more test? I mean, I guess you can't rule it out, but it's totally worth uh, watching there. And so you can see here, similarly, XOP finishes the same measure move, and you could go energy stock by energy stock and see the same patterns on the downside as it heads lower, you know, Exxon Mobil, for instance, um, finished that same measured move to the downside uh, as a double bottom retest to the downside. This same pattern exists over and over again on the entire energy complex. Uh, Philip, absolutely, you're uh, using the leaps. We're gonna talk about uh, in the, over the next couple of days, the repositioning on the existing ones. You know, we already have, uh, yeah, 2022 for sure. Uh, you're not doing 2021s, that's too short. 2023s are overkill. You, most of these commodity cycles take six to nine months in the impulses. So I think anything uh, that you do, of course, at the money, 2022, that's the way we teach it in the commodity video. Uh, there should be no different game plan here. Anything that you, uh, anyone wants to position on on this stuff, at the money, 2022s, that's the way we roll. Uh, and and, uh, and that's the, I wouldn't tell you to do it any other way. So, uh, so nonetheless, the energy complex is, is turning. I'm very curious. Now, the, the, w should we be buying the dip already on gold? It's not as clear. I think, um, I think that the energy market has a cleaner setup than gold. Gold's already run. Energy has been killed. Anyway, I like it. All right, so uh, let's talk breakout trades. Uh, for, uh, so first of all, S&P 500 in the zone. I still don't think anything has changed uh, from, from my storyline other than we're really trying to figure out whether the dollar index, what's the story there? And, that's, uh, and that can, this is gonna continue to consume a lot of our energy as we move forward. Um, well, Herman, it doesn't really matter in terms of XLE, can it get any worse? Uh, of course, things can always get worse. Uh, it's only about the asymmetry of whether or not um, it's worth the risk, right? Uh, I mean, the way I always put it is the upside potential of what you can make substantially greater than the further risk you have of engaging the trade here. And I feel that asymmetry exists here. There's no guarantees. Uh, there's always risk. Uh, we're being paid. Uh, we're paying to manage that risk with through options, but it's worth the risk, in my opinion. So, uh, what I want to talk about is the breakout trades, and in in, in an incredibly bizarre manner, both Alcoa and Halliburton have the exact same pattern, closed exactly at the same price of 11.93, and have pretty much the same targets. It's, it's the more like I, I thought it was like a twilight zone episode or something like, I don't know where the hell this came from, but they, but it, we, they were both on my watch list. And the fact that it will, that is not a typo, everyone that literally happened. Um, uh, and so the, uh, the point though is, and, and both of them have earnings. And this is a, another important thing to take into consideration. Both of them also, obviously October is, um, uh, October is uh, the big earnings impulse for the uh, going into this fourth quarter, and uh, but the point is, we're gonna, I, I felt it was worth publishing them, even though we we'll just have to kind of figure out how to manage the higher vol premiums going into the elections. Uh, but uh, but they are both Alcoa usually starts off the earnings cycle. It's one of the first companies to report. It's coming up before the October expiration. Halliburton's on uh, on the 19th. But let's take a look at both of them because the chart setups are actually identical on both of them, uh, which is, let's start with Alcoa. Basically, we had the big decline. You had the subsequent rally uh, higher. 
as it did, we basically have now reached a point where if Fibonacci retraced right into our kill zone, which is along this support line right over here, and we had the bullish engulfing candle come in uh, on the stall right off of the bottom. Uh, is there a chance if the dollar rips and the market sells that this could still zigzag one more time on the downside? It can. This is why if we're gifted a quick impulse up towards 13, doing a quick roll up makes a, a, a lot of sense as well. Uh, just uh, even though I set the target at 14, uh, if the whole market seems to be very toppy and rolling and you we're gifted with a Alcoa trading at 13, a tactical adjustment of a hedge up to 13 does make sense. Um, anyway, so, uh, and then we're looking for the, the continuation pattern uh, of this to break out and follow through on the upside to the top end of these target zones. And so we kind of put the profit taking zone in the zone area where a double top retest of this will allow us a tactical room to make adjustments. But really the target level is up into that zone up, uh, over there. And so, uh, Paul, how do I pick my first target level? Usually it has something to do with a FIB level. Like for instance, notice that this level, uh, uh, the target here is, uh, lines up with a 61.8 of the sell-off uh, as well. Uh, it usually is a round number where there are option strikes available so that making the tactical adjustment uh, to, this, uh, to the position has an at the money strike available to us. So there's a, there's a, a process to discovering where the target should logically be. Uh, but uh, those are basic rules of thumb that we have on that. So the, anyway, the point is, is that uh, we're, we're gonna give it a shot to see whether or not Alcoa can turn off of here. Halliburton is the same chart. So what's interesting is Halliburton has held up much better than most energy stocks. And um, while most energy stocks went for a full retest of their lows, Halliburton went nowhere near that was five, $6 lows during the bloodbath. Uh, and similarly, it uh, has done a 50% retrace of its uh, prior move. And again, you got the reversal candles coming off of there. They had a blowout earnings the first time around that, that drove that last impulse higher. They've been doing very well repositioning themselves. And so it's a, um, it's, it's a similar place, similar setup in the, uh, and in the way that they're all playing out. And we're going to find out whether they turn. Obviously, one is uh, aluminum. The other is uh, in the energy markets. But it's, uh, you can see that, that whether the commodity trade is on will influence whether they both work or not. And, uh, and they're worth, uh, in my opinion, ready to, they're both worth uh, putting on. And so let's see uh, how, the, how this plays out. So let's actually look at what we're dealing with on the uh, options and, and the, on the stock. So now Halliburton's trading around $12.22. Now let's talk about the uh, volatility. Uh, now, obviously, Halib uh, actually, uh, Alcoa is going to, uh, if we go out to the October 16th expiration, we're going to have to deal with um, the fact that um, Al uh, Alcoa is going to have volatility priced in and Halliburton uh, does not. So let's actually quickly show you what's going on in the Vol Lab. And uh, you would see something very similar on the, um, you would see something very similar on the charts of um, uh uh, sorry, on the uh, vol surface as well. What you can observe is that if we stay to the October expiration, we're pricing at about a 60 vol premium on Halliburton. And if you go in the post-election and overlapping the earnings, we're paying a 66 to 68% vol premium for those November, December options. And so right now uh, we have the opportunity to stay with Halliburton uh, in the, uh, we, we have the opportunity with Halliburton to stay uh, to the October 16th and give it a, a week or two to find out whether the stock is actually breaking out before we choose to you know, hold it over uh, the um, you know, hold it over the earnings and into the election. And so uh, when we pull up the options chain here, let's say we just stick with the October 16th. 
a $12 put is 40 cents. And that's right in line with uh, what we were looking for in terms of just uh, forking it out. So um, we're talking about a 60 cent uh, total risk, right? 40 cents for the options, about 20 cents for the downside of the stock before the $12 put kicks in. And, uh, and so we can, I think we can do 1500 shares would be reasonable um, for, from a perspective of about a sizing a thousand dollar risk for the start. So it's putting out about an $18,000 position in Halliburton, buying 15 of these at the money protective puts. Now, when it comes time to dealing with the earnings, uh, uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with the earnings, uh, we're in a situation where um, we may choose to collar it or hedge it with... Um, a, a put spread versus that of just an outright protective put. There are different things that we can do to try to mitigate the fact that we're paying a substantial vol premium in there with that. Um, and so that's uh, in there. Now, the, Doug, the one consideration for the Hail Mary or the synthetic on Halliburton, first of all, when you're dealing with a $12 stock, it's not as necessary to be building synthetics it's usually the, it makes a lot more sense when you're dealing with those $100, $200 stocks where it requires a much larger capital outlay. With that said, the, the consideration is that once you cross into November, you're now dealing with a higher volatility premium because you're now dealing with something that's overlapping both the election and the earnings. And so when you're building a synthetic, you now are talking about a mismatch of where you're paying up a substantial vol. Well, it's not, it's like eight vol points. It's not a crazy amount, but uh, it, you are paying up to do it. But let's just say uh, you wanted to grab an 80 cent Delta call on Halliburton. You can see paying $2 and 60 cents for a $10 in the money call is uh, where you could find a synthetic uh, carrying into that period. And as well, I think November is where you'd have to go for a Hail Mary. And so if you're uh, bad, swinging for the profit-taking zone, you're going to go up and grab those 35-cent options or those 20-cent options out to November uh, in the $15 and $16 strikes. Those are, uh, those are definitely where you are going to want to let uh, – here, I'll demonstrate it here with uh, the Hail Mary with the $15 Novembers. And we'll, let's just snag like 10 of these. Um, John, yeah, you can go to December. You're just going to pay up a premium. Uh, to me, I don't mind December, but the way I look at it is, is that with breakout trades, either they work or they don't work, right? And it doesn't take more than a couple weeks to find out whether the breakout trade is going to be a dud or whether it's going to work. And if you go all the way to December, you're just putting that much more time premium on the table and you're just going to find some way to, uh, to convince yourself to, to hold on to the position all the way until December. It's like either it's going to work or it's not. You want to have some way of, um, of finding out. I mean, I would rather start with November. And if it's working, then you could always roll out to December, right? I think that that's the better uh, way to potentially a approach it. Anyway, now the, the issue with Alcoa is that the October 16th expiration actually – uh, uh, overlaps the earnings, which uh, are on the 14th, right? And so when we're dealing with Alcoa, what you can observe here is the volatility premium on that front month is, uh, is about five vol points lower than December. That's about 70, but it's not crazy, I guess. Uh, I mean, the, the November overlapping elections is only 3% cheaper yeah, I mean, maybe the right thing to do is is actually pay the vol premium to October, and uh, and to, and play the uh, the earnings uh, move, and uh, know that there there potentially is a a volatile move coming right on the earning. Uh, so you can see here the uh, October sixteenth at the money twelve dollars fifty nine cents. Actually, not that much different in total risk than what we did on Halliburton because we had about sixty cent risk net of the capital gain, um, sorry, capital uh, loss risk. But uh, here, you know, you, if, if we turn around and we can do the same thing, we'll put out 1,500 shares of Alcoa.
and uh, buy in 15 of these at the money protective puts. And, uh, and we're in there. So from a Hail Mary perspective, uh, you can go out to November. And again, if you go out to like the four, like the, yeah, the $15 strike uh, is uh, 28 cents, perfectly, perfectly reasonable. Uh, and you let's say uh, we'll pick up like 10 of these for the Hail Mary, swinging for the fences. And uh, a November 15 call is, is reasonable that way. As well, if you wanted the synthetic, a, uh, going out to November, you can see you're grabbing an 80 cent delta at the $10 strike as well. Those options are $2.44. Those that wanna build the synthetic uh, that way, uh, that's, that's on the table as well. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out, so, so that's the two breakout trades. What I wanted to point out is that I actually was tempted to republish range resources uh, as a brand new setup. I actually still really like it. Now, the only thing that is like the one thing that hang, hangs me up a little bit is that we haven't beat the FIB zone. This is, I'm gonna break it to a one hour, sorry. Yeah. And what I wanna point out is that even though it nicely reversed from like the $6.30 low to 7.16, a pretty good percentage move, we haven't beaten this hourly fib. In fact, we're trading at it right now. And what I would find rather encouraging for range resources is if we saw that, for instance, it came in with one more bull candle and then consolidated and did not make a lower low. I mean, if we saw some sort of a setup like that, I would, I would be completely repositioning for another advance on, on this. And uh, I'm, I was tempted to republish it. Uh, it. We're still in it, but I was thinking of bringing it to a member's attention as a new opportunity, not just as the one that we're gonna stick with, but I still actually like it. I still like it, it's good. Uh, I still also really like Johnson Johnson. Johnson Johnson hasn't started working yet, but I like it. Uh, I still think all the same setup is there for that. Speaking of which, I wanted to just touch, uh, give everyone a quick update on those biotechs. Look at that breakout on, uh, on the IBB, right? Nice breakout. How many of you ended up moving in on the uh, biotechs or whether through Amgen or, or through IBB? I'm just curious. George, you did it, right? There you go. And uh, uh, Jimmy, a urine on Amgen, perfect. But look at the way, like this is a, the classic wedge. I love, love when it goes and retests and does not make a lower low. When it turned up over here, it was really nice. And, but then when you go to look at Amgen, uh, nicely rolling up, hasn't yet broken out. If Amgen here manages to break to a 52 week high, I mean, we're talking about an advance to 280 to 290 on the upside. Uh, keep a close eye on this one. The, yeah, 280, 290 on the upside there. That will sh shoot the IBB straight up towards uh, its highs toward 145, maybe even uh, punch 150 on the upside there. Bo uh, whether Johnson Johnson has moved, it's much more, much more of that broader healthcare uh, play, but uh, the biotechs have already started their move. Like if you go XLV, which is the broader healthcare, uh, the, you can see the same setup as Johnson & Johnson, which is it zigzagged in this correction downwards, rolling up. Uh, that would punch the broader um, XLV healthcare uh, on a breakout would be targeting uh, 112 to 115 on the upside. I like it. And then you could go to all sorts of like uh, AbV. You know, like this fits the same criteria of that zigzag correction down. Will we see this roll up and, and, and turn higher off of this consolidation? You know, Eli Lilly, the same type of very deep consolidation. These, these health cares have not turned yet, right? I haven't looked at Merck. Let's see, yeah, look, Merck is coming right into the on the mark zone on this pullback, like look at this, right into the FIB zone. Those all that in the technical master's program that are always looking for on the marks, like this is it. Right, like you get these um, uh, uh, these moves into there. How? Let's see how Pfizer is trading here. Like same thing. Like look at Pfizer trading down into this 
fib zone uh, right in here rolling up may if if the whole market's going to go the healthcare's uh, the broad space looks like it's ready to go uh i let's see how's abbott looking yeah abbott like all abbott did was consolidate a 50% retracement in a zigzag beautiful uh, sequence of breakouts if abbott doesn't give this uh, consolidation back I mean, that's a shoot to 120 plus. Listen, if you like the healthcare, I, I publish Johnson & Johnson, but pick your poison. This entire space looks like it's setting up for the exact patterns that, uh, that, that we've been looking at. Uh, and so if you have a preference of one over another, they're all good. Uh, we're going to track Johnson & Johnson. Let's see how it plays out. Uh, so, uh, Lenar. Uh, continues, uh, it, it touched into our profit taking zone. I still, there's nothing, it did nothing wrong yet. I mean, did a little bit of a reversal, but I still think that this can pierce properly into our profit taking zone. We'll just see what happens. Target t uh, kissing the profit taking zone, flagging formation that's advancing, has done nothing wrong, still working its way higher, still like it. Uh, this is the make it or break it moment on the Euro. Uh, that's the 118 level, 111 on this. This is coming right into this fib zone. Will we reject here and make the next impulse down? Otherwise, we have no business being bear, uh, bullish to US dollar, bearish to Euro if this doesn't fail here. This is an incredibly important moment. I still like our position. In fact, if this is an incredibly asymmetric moment to put the trade on brand new uh, off this 111 handle. Again, it's not guaranteed to work, but it's an incredibly asymmetric moment to be trying to hammer the short on, um, on the Euro through the FXE at this very level. Uh, did we just see the death of the um, uh, regional bank short? I mean, we got into our profit taking zone on the retest of the low and it feels very, the advance here feels very much in the spirit of what is making me more optimistic energy. Which, and so like this fast reversal off of a key, uh, key test, if we see that regional banks get above 40, we have no business being short regional banks anymore. Like if we see them still weaken back down, then there's still the chance that we're gonna finish that move to the downside. But, but if regional banks bust 40 on the upside and are consolidating, we have no business staying short here. And, uh, and so that's, that's something that we're gonna watch closely as to whether that, and that's not much different for ADI. Uh, that this breakdown was incredibly important because we were going to find out whether or not the shorts were going to engage the downside. If we see that these green candles are reversing this uh, back up, we have zero business remaining short uh, ADI, right? Like uh, to me, that breakdown sequence was gonna, was the big tell because here is uh, if, it was, if it was the beginning of the breakdown sequence of that gap lower, then we should see follow through selling. Obviously the stock market is at a critical level, right? If the S&P fails right here at, um, at 3,400 in this zone and rolls down off of here, then all of these shorts can like, imagine S&P fails here at 3,400, turns down, ADI turns down from here, uh, regional banks turned down from here. It could, uh, they're all at critical levels. They're either all going to reject here or they're all going to break out higher and we have no business staying short, right? It's, it, it's, we'll find out here in, in, in the coming days. Uh, uh, the other question, was this enough of a correction for us to be loading up on gold, on the miner, sorry. Now, gold is already a trade. It, it, we've been waiting for this. Now, on the short and measured move basis, we got into the fibs on what was a zigzag, right? But what we're waiting for is to find out whether there's one more leg. Because if we see a rejection here at this 58 level on the GDXJ, there could still be one more zigzag and it could end up being more of a retrace of the entire uh, move where we could still have one more drop to 44, 45. But that may never come, right? Uh, Eric Townsend and company are all waiting for this magic pullback to be, buy the dip. Maybe it'll, it'll, it'll never come and they're just going to be on the sideline. Uh, to me, 
if we see that gold holds in here, that could be it. And then it could be bullish from here. Just not ready to publish new gold trades today. Uh, but uh, maybe by next week, if this turns up properly, maybe gold will turn bullish and we'll have to be loading up on all the breakout trades on gold miners higher from here. That's uh, definitely on my watch list of things to keep a close eye on, right? And you can see like if you take a Yamana gold, it's the same chart, right? Uh, and it's the same chart on so many of the miners. It's the, it's this, it's the same story pretty much right across the board. Anyway, we're, we're throwing our hat in the ring with, uh, with uh, some of these resource names, obviously. So uh, we're, turning on, uh, we're putting that on. If you, uh, Jamie, if you want to play Schlumberger, um, uh, that's fine. I, I think the Halliburton chart was just a little cleaner. But uh, it's the, it, it, the same scenario, right? Like, so if you, um, yeah, Mike, uh, it's funny you ask whether Katusa's coming on to Macro Voices. We, I think we have him booked for November 5th, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm just going from memory, but he is, he is coming on. But uh, actually, the big thing, the big special will be our um, big uranium episode coming up uh, uh, next week. Not this week, but next week. Uh, and so uh, we got Mike Alkin and, uh, oh, my God, forgot a second guest but anyway we got back to back guests uh for a big uranium special and so i think that's something all you can look forward to as well anyway uh schlumberger if uh, just very quickly here if um if you're uh, if you're looking for the synthetic on schlumberger the 80 delta Yeah, you. I mean, you pretty much have to go to the twelve and a half to get the, and you're going for a ninety cent delta down at that moment. So that's that's where what you'd be looking at uh, on, on that play. Anyway, so uh, so that's um, that's what I wanted to talk about. That. So let's let's open this up a little bit and get go to some of the things that uh, you uh, some of you want to talk about. So Fleur FLR. Look, uh, I we we got hammered. I. Uh, I was. I remember we bought the uh, the fib zones back over here at the start of the year and just got. Or no, no, it was back over here in the um, in 2019, and we got hammered on floor with this pullback over here. Uh, that was one of our one of the stingers we had. But with that said, these infrastructure stocks are interesting, and there is no denying that floor has already bled out. It's already been taken to the cleaners. I mean, at one point, the stock was a $3 stock, right? And so, I mean, the bloodletting is already rear view. It's coming back for a FIB retest of its low. I mean, if you absolutely want to take a shot at these infrastructure stocks turning here, I can't blame you. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's the same setup we always publish. And so I can't uh, contradict myself to say that there isn't a setup here. Uh, it's just whether or not this is where you want to be allocating capital to. Um, like if you go to look at some of the other ones, like Jacobs is already running on the upside. What was the other infrastructure play? There was another one we were looking at the other day. Uh, if any, is it ACOM? ACM, yeah. Yeah, like that, uh, that one already rolled up off of the low. Ah, you know, that's a nice breakout for sure. I mean, like uh, the, the problem with chasing ACOM uh, was that the buying on the dip was back on the FIB zone back a few months ago. Now that it's already broken out, you're sort of chasing into a move that has probably a double top retest potential up at 50-52. It's um, uh, on that uh, USCR, US Concrete. Yeah, that's just beginning the breakout after a consolidation. I mean, these are all very interesting. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I, with something like um, a US concrete, you're basically chasing at this moment off of the consolidation. I like buying the dips into the fibs, a little trickier here at this, uh, at this moment for some, some of these in there. Looking at, um, okay, so Mike, I know you wanted to talk about eyeball here for a moment. Uh, so, uh, you know, why is it not taking off with the steepener in play? Uh, I wouldn't overread into that. Right now, what's ha you want to realize that the major product that the eyeball carries is actually the tip. And uh, so I'm just going to use the tip ETF itself. That just shows that 
it kind of broke down because, well, bonds are not doing well right now. And so all the bonds right now are dragging on this and the eyeballs dragging a bit on that. But I also want to point out is that all of the steepener um, credit uh, um, uh, products and the derivatives that uh, Nancy built into the eyeball need a, a legitimate steepening, right? Like I know the fives thirties are steepening, but like when you go to the twos tens and you put this on a weekly chart, I want to point out that we have not yet seen uh, a steepening cycle. Like when you see steepeners really kick in on the upside, uh, th that's where the real cashing in on all those derivatives comes in. Uh, to me, uh, you know, already expecting all of those constant maturity swaps that they've built in there to be cashing in just because we got one little uh, green breakout candle on the weeklies. I think it's just your, it, it may be just that your expectations were uh, um, just that it would be far more responsive on the first little tick. We need a, I think you need to blow a 1% on the upside on the steepener for all of those uh, constant maturity swaps to really uh, start paying off in huge thing. Like the, the idea where iVol can be up 20, 30% from just the, uh, those constant maturity swaps, you really have to be north of a 1% on the steepener uh, in order for that uh, narrative to play out. Anyway, um, just wanted to touch on uh, I know some of you want to talk about those things like junk bonds and, uh, and the emerging market, the EMLC. I want to point out that the EMLC is going to is a two angled play. One, it needs a bullish US dollar because this is local currency junk bonds. And so there's an inherent currency play being built in. And the other one is the broader um, yield structure of the global bond complex, right? Like where, where are comparative yields on, on sovereign debt uh, and particularly in the emerging market space. And uh, so I think that the breakdown move that they were looking for needs a U.S. dollar rally. I mean, if we get into a scenario where the U.S. dollar starts having its face ripped off and, another, and the Dixie's heading to 89, we're just going to have to admit that the uh, that it, our timing on the EMLC may have been completely off. It's uh, we, well, let's see what happens here. I ju I don't want to overread it. I like our position. I'm not going to change the position we have. Uh, I just think that we need the dollar rally to really ca get what we want out of it. Similarly, HYG. This is this is an interesting thing because obviously bonds are selling off on the treasury level, but. Uh, HYG's upticking, but the thing is, is that junk bonds uh, actually have a pretty evident correlation to equity. More, uh, I think um, junk bonds are more correlated often to equities than they are to uh, investment grade bonds. Uh, and that's just the junk quality because it's the credit risk to one degree or another uh, associated with um, with these things. So the fact that the stock market uptick has sort of driven this, it, you, it almost feels like a, the Russell 2000 chart in some degree or another, the way that this is, is, is rolling up. And so anyway, uh, I, I still think that these trades are should stay on. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how they play out on the um, uranium plays, like Cameco. I uh, I th I'm a buyer on dip. I don't. I have nothing else to say here. I I I have a core holding in Cameco, and I'm not I'm not getting rid of it anytime soon. NGD. Um, so uh, new gold. Hey, how many of you held on to the uh, this since we had it all down at a buck? Because we don't, we're not tracking this anymore. But how many? I know some of you decided to stay. There you go, Kyle, Brian, Dominic. Okay, so a bunch of you did. Well, congratulations to all of you, right? <laughs> it's finally paying off. Uh, it was the dog, wasn't it? Like this thing had its face ripped off from 15 bucks down to. At one point, we had it down to 50 cents. We were holding that one dollar option. And now it's finally uh, gonna. Uh, there you go. It's paying off. Don't don't get rid of it. This is one of those that will be a potential five bagger. Like you, if if you, we have a gold breakout, this thing here could go, have gone from that dollar price to four or five bucks. 
and then you're then you're going to get vindicated for all of the uh, uh, the we spent a year in purgatory down there, and it pays off. But this is a perfect example of what's going to happen to energy stocks, right? Uh, uh, if you look at what happened, is like when new gold was going down, it. Uh, it kept finishing these measured moves lower. It, uh, it was trading like dog shit here for the longest time. Every rally wouldn't stick. No one wants to touch it with a 10-foot bull. And anyone that stuck it through has already uh, doubled their money off of the low and, uh, and potentially are going to see these things. This is, this is the way Cuppy rolls, by the way, right? Like Cuppy buys dog shit that, is gonna, that just bleeds for a while. And then when it turns, he makes, it turns it into a 10-bagger. Right. And that's the way these things roll on some of these. Right. And um, uh, anyway, so we'll see what happens here. Uh, you know, Sammy, you could al always with the end, with new gold. I mean, if you wanted to from an options strategy perspective, you can lever up by still. Let, let me just take a look at the chain. I mean, if you absolutely want uh, massive volatility in your life, you can, uh, you can snag these like at the money options. Like you could go to the two and a half or 75 cents and really lever up. I don't know. It's, I, I mean, they're being priced at like almost a hundred percent vol premium. I don't know what kind of, you want to almost treat a $2 stock like an option in itself. I don't know whether it's worth playing the leaps from here. Uh, maybe hedge it out with a shorter term play. We'll see. Anyway, um, Suncor, look, we sold our income rights on this. Um, but let me just put this on. I, I think Suncor is going to turn higher. This is just the, like, if I'm going to overlay Suncor and Exxon Mobil, uh, and the point I want to just illustrate, it's the same chart. I mean, maybe a Suncor has been a little bit more volatile, but uh, it's it's pretty much, it's the, the same energy play. I have, I have nothing new to say on this, George. Uh, like if either we're going to be right on the whole play or we're not. And if we're going to be right on the, the turn on energy, then Suncor is going to go up just like everything else, right? Um, uh, Sammy, sell something on – well, listen, if you want to make an a, a interesting income, you could turn around and snag – like. You could, like, for instance, you could go out on a leap and sell a $2 uh, put option on new gold for, you know, 65, 70 cents. Like, I mean, you could go and snag these kind of income plays. I mean, it is, I guess you could. I mean, you could also, well, it's an interesting idea. It's like, you could buy the stock at two bucks. You go in there, you buy this uh, protective put for 75 cents. Let's say you get 70 cents somewhere. That's, that was the last trade on it. So you pick it up for 70 cents. You turn around and sell the $3 strike covered call for 55 cents. You're out 15 cents uh, net of the two, and you've collared it between two to three dollars. And then, so the stock's at 215. You have all the upside to three, all the downside risk removed below two. It's 15 cents to carry the option. And you have a, you have a chance of making a half decent high end percentage return on the upside there. I mean, and it's not much different than many of the other kind of, um, uh, of collars that you can build on almost all gold things, right? Uh, anyway, uh, ideas are there. You can certainly uh, put on any of those. Anyway, uh, is there anything I forgot to cover? Nat gas. Uh, uh, well, listen, I, like I said, with range resources, I love it. I, I, wanna, I, thought, I think that, that this was a fake out dip down just to wash out traders uh, uh, at a little bit of a lower low. Still like it. Um, I think Nat Gas is turning around. I still like, I, I think watching that December contract is what you should do. I think that this entire sell off on Nat Gas was just a, a, the typical kind of little washout move to the FIB zone down over here. Uh, I think that uh, Nat Gas can turn up. I'm bullish it. Uh, I think that it's a reasonable play on the upside. Brett Apple. So listen. Uh, I still think that this was a major high on Apple. And what we're witnessing is some sort of backfill. And I still think there'll, there'll be another leg lower. Uh, you know, to me, all that we've done is bounced higher. I still want to leave it open. Our biggest problem will become if the move doesn't happen in the next three weeks because we, because we can't hold it into November 
because of the, uh, the nature of back spreads. And so really what would be nice is if the whole market, if, if the S&P turned off of 3,400 and we saw a pre-election dump on the downside would be a tactically benef- uh, ideal for us, right? Um, and so let's see whether or not uh, we, we have enough time on this trade uh, to play out that way. Similarly, Tesla, uh, I'm surprised it's pinned. Uh, I would have thought that we would have already blown out. This is sort of, uh, I mean, in the end, I still think Tesla has room to be quite volatile, but uh, right now it's, it's pinned in this range. I still am very bearish. I still think that's a major high. I mean, the longer Tesla waits, the more the wind is taken out of the sails of the bulls that have been riding their long gamma place, right? Like um, the, basically forcing dealers short and squeezing them out. The longer these weekly options get burned, it washes out all of those manipulators out, uh, out of the game. And then maybe gravity will take over and, and slam it to the downside. I still want to be short. I, I like our, our position there. Uh, is it too late to get into the grains? Um, no, no, no. Uh, like, okay, yes, for wheat, right? This pullback. So like what you want to think is, is that this, uh, the measured move on the upside of wheat for this flag is already, like this is the profit-taking zone of this impulse here, uh, Joanne. Uh, and so as we, uh, now that means you have to wait for another dip on, on the grains, uh, like some sort of consolidation to go long again. I'm not saying that it's over on the, uh, but it, it definitely is, uh, I wouldn't be chasing this. Now, when you go to something like corn, that flagging formation leaves more room. Actually, let me just go more specifically to, um, let's, let's just specifically look at the December contract. And what, uh, what you can observe here is that there's lots of room for uh, 2019 price levels. If corn, gives you a little bit of a pullback to buy in, you can play um, the completion of this movement of corn up to like 410, 420 on the upside. Hard for me to tell someone to buy a breakout candle, but if you have a very short-term little washout dip down toward 375, you can use those to be, be buying the dips on, uh, on those types of, uh, of movements. Same with soybean, already had this monstrous move, but this is just, um, uh, uh, the flag breakout candle was just a few days ago, right? Like that, or a few trading sessions ago. Uh, if this becomes a breakout, like I'm gonna put on a weekly chart, then you have a scenario where, where we could have an impulse on this breakout that basically will head toward some of those highs from 2016, right? And so like a, a breakout on the daily chart like this, you can see would, would send, uh, soya bean up into these previous highs up into these zones over here. I mean that you can trade up into that that area as well uh, if you wanted to uh, to catch that. Uh, but I ju- it's the wheat the wheat price that is just a little too far on that front. Anyway, uh, the fertilizer stocks I like it. Listen, uh, this is a that's a breakout candle off of uh, off of this little consolidation flag. Yeah, anyone who wants to play a nutrient uh, for a punch to forty five, forty six on the upside, totally qu- uh, good with it. I mean that's a like a mosaic. Uh, just consolidating potentially uh, the break sideways consolidation is breaking to the upside. By the way, I wanted to just, I, I published Alcoa, but I have to say I'm very interested in the uh, thing. I'm seriously debating whether we should be adding tech resources into our long-term uh, option plays tomorrow for our resource segment. Um, now, I want to just talk about the long history of redonkulous volatility that this stock has had. I'm going to go to weekly chart. I want to point out that this is virtually one of Canada's largest resource companies. And this thing in the two boom bust cycles went from 56 bucks down to three from $3 back to 68, from 68 back down to three, from three back to 32. This stock uh, has uh, made and broken more traders than any uh, resource stock I know. This thing is 
volatile as F. Thank you for pointing out. And it, it is nuts. The point I'm trying to emphasize is that you've missed nothing if you think that you've missed a move from $6 to 13. Now, with that said, what I want to now do is put on, uh, I, I tend not to favor using moving averages, but I think this will do the trick. I want to point out that the last bull cycle that uh, happened on tech resources, there was an important, con I want you to all observe the way tech resources consolidated above its moving averages here and here. Now, in each of those cases, it went from $3 to already 11 bucks. And a lot of people at that moment were like, shit, I missed it. I should have bought it earlier. I missed it, right? But look at the money that this stock continued to make in the following six months, right? The th stock went from 11 to 26 bucks in a, a, just a, a face ripping rally. But notice it was all above those moving averages. So look where we are today. After that bottom, we are in the midst of a consolidation above those moving averages. Are, are we about to witness a deja vu of tech resources doing some redonkulous rally to 40 bucks on the upside? And so uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm seriously contemplating going in there with some leaps on tech resources uh, and, uh, and playing this move. I'm, we'll talk more about it uh, uh, tomorrow. But anyway, some of these resource names uh, are very much on my, um, uh, on my watch list. Uh, so um, Rupert, you want to look at Zoom? Uh, look, uh, the fact, okay, it's consolidating. So it finishes a measured move. Zoom finished this measured move, shortened the one, mind you, but it did. And we're in the midst of a consolidation. What I would say for Zoom is very simple. Does this consolidation stay in the 400s? If, if, uh, if we see Zoom hold this in, it could pull vault for one more advance. But if we see that it, it, it slams the downside and starts blowing down south of 400, then the Zoom story is over uh, for this impulse. Uh, P, uh, Peloton, oh my God. Uh, you know what? I want to short this stock more than anything. I, listen, I actually believe Zoom has a real business model. Uh, where Zoom actually is providing a service and we're, we're moving into a, an online world and Zoom has got a great product. But Peloton, I call bullshit on people buying exercise bikes perpetually. This is going to be a Fitbit. I honestly think Peloton is going to be a screaming short at some point. Uh, I, am, I am a seller on this business model. And I, I think that as soon as the fad wears out, Peloton is going to have a proper face ripping drop. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so I would, I would say you almost pair it, go long zoom, short Peloton, <laughs> right? Like just, uh, play it that way. Anyway, it's finishing this move up into here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mark, Peloton changed your life. Uh, I, you know, exercise bikes existed for a long time, bud. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pick on you. All right. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, Peloton is market cap is thirty thousand dollars per customer. That's that's a lot. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so the um, anyway, I I'm a, I'm a seller on Peloton. So the um, it, it it hasn't done anything bearish, by the way. This is just finishing a measured move. It, the, tur the chart has not turned. Like at least uh, I can argue that Tesla's chart has turned. Uh, Peloton has not turned. By the way, so this is um, the uh, Smile Direct Club. This looks like a, a, a bull consolidation that may actually break out to the upside. And so watch for this. If, if this thing here breaks out this pattern, that's going to come and test that previous high up around 15. Uh, not a huge percentage move, but uh, it does look like it can make a, a, that push there, Mike. Uh, the Um, what else is there? A TLT. Oh, Joe, Joe coffee. No, wow. Oh, no, 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 not Joe coffee. Joe is, uh, uh, the cuppy play playing St. Joe's. My goodness. 
you know, uh, Cuppy's actually a little bit sensitive that he, uh, that he's going to go to jail. He, he, <laughs> don't tell him I said that. Anyway, uh, the, um, uh, so yeah, he, his article hit uh, zero edge. Uh, that's anyway. Uh, the, the point is, is that, uh, uh, this pullback, it's going to have a pullback at some point, see how it consolidates. I, you, if you want my opinion, I honestly think he's selling into some of the strength. I mean, if it was the largest position in the book, when you, when the thing gaps this way, you have to think that Cuppy's selling into the news. You got to, uh, yeah. Shocking, right? Uh, it, r r everyone should never forget that Cuppy is just talking his book. Right. Uh, and, uh, and that's, and you, so you have to just take it all with a, um, grain of salt, right? Like it's, um, uh, anyway, uh, this, this breakout here measures, uh, is pretty much done. It's measured move. It's going to fade off of there. And then what it happens off of that fade, that's going to tell us everything you want to know. If, if this thing consolidates back down to 23, 22 and holds nicely and rolls up, we could, uh, you could revisit it and see, uh, see how that uh, plays out from there. Uh, but uh, anyway, Sting, look, uh, I still, I, I am income writing, uh, I am income writing a lot of this uh, Scorpio. I, I still think that the income rights down at 10 and eight bucks are just no brainers. Uh, I've got a pile of them. I still own some of the stock tank. Like I know he was talking TK tankers. Like, look, there is still risk that these tanker stocks are still not done selling, but I would put them in the same category. I would put them as the same category as where we are with energy stocks. We just don't know whether their ultimate lows are still in. I mean, can, it would be a shocker to see TK still test 10 bucks or nine bucks in the downside possible. But I honestly think just like, I feel that owning these tanker stocks is going to feel a lot like new gold. And so new gold, we started tracking new gold and, and went through a number of these yo-yo rides. And then we watched new gold get its face ripped off with a drop down to 50 cents down over here. And in the end, anyone who just seen it through there, uh, if you even bought a 50 cents, you are already up, you know, 300 plus percent, right? Point is, is, is that, uh, to me, the, uh, I think shipping stocks have many of the same characteristics. It's just, are we with shipping stocks just here and that there's still more selling to come before it turns? Uh, we'll see. Occidental Petroleum. Uh, I, listen, I, still, I, I think this is so interesting off of here. We have our options adjusted here. Love it. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know what? It, if you find Occidental to have too many risks and it doesn't fit your risk profile, uh, turn around and, and just play the index. But those of you that have um, your willingness to go out the risk profile, I still think Occidental is totally worth uh, the, the risk of putting it in there. Anyway, um, all right. I think that's enough. Uh, oh, yeah. R Ruger. Like, um, I mean, those of you that want to drink uh, the, um, the Guns Kool-Aid, I mean, it's turning off the fib zone after zigzagging the retrace. I mean, if there was ever a time to step back in to these gun stocks, uh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, this is uh, this is it, right? The loot. Uh, anyway, that like this pullback is right into the textbook shit that we do. Like, I mean, that's uh, that's there. You can certainly play it. Silver, listen, I. Uh, I, I like silver. Well, the only thing that we have to figure out is whether or not these silver stocks and silver itself have one more zigzag. It's the same story as gold. I wish I could tell you something different. I am super bullish gold and silver. Just, uh, we don't know what, like I'm, I feel that energy is a more immediate opportunity. Gold and silver might still zigzag one more time before the breakout. And so I, I feel that it's worth holding. I'm not, I haven't given up a single uh, uh, ounce of my silver. Uh, and so it's, it's in there. We'll just have to see. The, 
Ben, is 21 the bottom? Entirely possible, right? Like, I mean, uh, it, we, we repositioned our collar at 20, uh, along this low for a reason, right? And uh, it's because it hit the fib zone. That could be like, maybe what we'd see is like a fake out where silver and gold just have one big breakdown sequence Everyone's like, oh my God, here we go again. And they go in for a retest like, like we just saw in oil and then they just go. I mean, that's entirely possible as well, right? I, bottom line, I like it. It's just, it's just we, it might be a longer wait on that one. Pan W, um, Apollo, uh, Palo Alto. Yeah, look. I mean, it's been pulling back. I mean, what it would be positive on a stock like this after this pullback for it to beat the FIB zones, right? I mean, if it rejected here, it would be the only big risk on that one, Brandon. Um, SPY, okay, look, the S&P is the S&P. Like, this is just the FIB bounce. Like I was saying, if there's ever a point to the, off of this FIB where you want to be short, it's right here, right? Like uh, when it comes into this zone right here, this 340, 345 zone is right in there. And, uh, and that's, uh, I'm not going to change my tune on the S&P that's there. Um, Melly, uh, this is uh, the, uh, you know, it's the same scenario. Beautiful run, consolidation, and we're approaching the FIB zone right up along here, right? If this stock can beat this FIB zone and this becomes a consolidation, then this thing is going to have another substantial rally that could easily be extending out to 15, 1600 on the upside. But all of that upside starts with beating this FIB zone, because if it doesn't, then just like what we're talking about with silver and gold, there, we can't rule out another zigzag correction off of this FIB before the turn happens at a, off of a, a lower level. And so this is, this is just what you, we have to watch for on all these types of stocks on that. Um, anyway, so listen, we'll leave it at that for today. Uh, I am very tempted to add uh, tech resources into a long-term option position uh, tomorrow. That's uh, just sharing my uh, thinking out loud thing, but uh, I still wanna review a couple other ideas. But listen, we'll spend much more time the next two days talking about uh, w how to position the bigger trades in the portfolio. But right now, what, let's see whether oil bottomed. I think it's the single it's not only a huge uh, uh, thing. Oh yeah, by the way, thank you for pointing that, Anthony. Yes, the Trading Masters, Module 8, 12 o'clock. Me and Kevin on, will be online in an hour. Uh, that um, that uh, is on. And so uh, looking forward to seeing all of you, the Trading Masters members on for that. Uh, Rupert Oil has bottomed. Well, that's a bold call. I'd like to say that I feel that there's a legitimate chance it has. I think it really bottomed actually back in April, May. This was just a retest. But uh, will this be the true buying opportunity? I think there's a very legitimate chance. It's not often, li listen, uh, you know, major buying opportunities happen only a few times a year. Like there, a lot of the stuff that you come on every morning with me, a lot of it is a lot of the same, a lot of the same. And what we come on is to identify those couple times a year where a major opportunity presents itself at a major turning point where it's going to impact your returns in a big way. That could be the energy play here. Uh, let's find out. I mean, I wanna give it more than one day to really uh, start pounding the table that it's, tr it's true, but uh, don't ignore it. There's an opportunity here. Anyway, uh, we'll continue the conversation tomorrow. See my Trading Masters members online uh, in a bit. Thanks. Everybody.